and welcome back to the Wild of Football show here on Sports Tonight Live. I'm Ina Rizuki and now we're moving on to discuss France. And of course there was a huge game, 4-4, at the same time that uh, Milan-Juventus was happening. Uh, what did you think of the game? Well, I mean, it's a game where you've got eight goals and uh, people storming forward and comebacks and everything. Uh, Carlo Ancelotti nearly lost his first game since moving to Paris Saint-Germain, but the most dramatic of, en uh, of endings, Guillaume Moreau, in the 93rd minute with, uh, with PSG's goalkeeper, Salvador Sirigu, hanging out in the opposing <laughs> D, um, nails the perfect header. And uh, it was interesting, just, just before that, Mathieu Bodmer, of course, is a former, former Lyon player, makes an absolute sitter one-on-one -on -one with, uh, with uh, Hugo Lloris. So of course, Lloris also made some fantastic saves as well. So it was an entertaining game, but you can also see why both these teams are just a long, long uh, way away from, from being the finished artist. Leon should have really held on for that. I mean, what did you think of that, Ralph? Did you, uh, did you feel sorry for well, them? Well, I'm still shocked, and I uh, wonder what uh, Andy will say about this, that Ligue 1 is, is turning into this free-scoring, free-for-all, no tactics, let's all go and score goals kind of league. No one knows how to defend. For years and years, it was the lowest-scoring league in <laughs> Europe. <laughs> and um, then, baboom. And now, what's going on? What's going on, Andy? Hello, Andy Russell. How are you? Hello, I'm well. How are you all? Very well, thank you. Tell us what is going on in, in response to Raf's question there. Well, Raf, one swallow doesn't make a summer. Um, <laughs> there were eight goals in that game, and there were seven in the previous six on that Saturday. Right. Uh, <laughs> we were lucky to get that game. That's what there is to it. Uh, I, I think it uh, quite well sums up the Saturday, the ebb and flow of, of Ligue 1. You never really know what you're, what, what you're going to get, whether it's, whether it's A grade or gristle. What a, um, where does this leave my, my, my man Carlo? Because I, I thought Leon initially played very well. There's, there's no scenario where you concede four goals and, and you can be happy. And, of course, you know, now that Montpellier have, have, have passed them again. Um, but does he take any positives from, the, from, from that performance? Uh, PSG? Yeah. Yeah, I think I think they did just because um, the last two games they've they've been outplayed in both of them by uh, Montpellier and Lyon, who really should be a, a title contender. Um, they're two things have really let them down. I think they're inexperienced, um, which means they've lost a few away games that they shouldn't have. They've lost nine or nine games already this season, which is more than they've lost for twelve years in a league season. And with, you know, we're still only in February. Um, and, and the other thing is they're totally tatty defence. Um, you know, I think Leon would have blown away most teams in, in the first half of that. You know, they scored three brilliant goals in, in, in five minutes, which PSG couldn't really do that much about. Um, they, they were just absolutely blown away. And I, I think that shows the, the quality that Leon have and the team they could be, but that they're not. And, um, you know, we, we know PSG have got a, a way to go in terms of um, in, in terms of becoming a proper team, and they showed that against Montpellier uh, last week. But I, I think you, you know, you look at the equalising goals against Montpellier, uh, and this one on um, Saturday against Lyon, top top quality. Again, I don't think Lyon could have really done that much about the equaliser. It's absolutely superb header by Waro, and I think we talked about him a couple of weeks ago, and how everyone said he he looks like a spare part. He looks like someone who, who won't really last under Ancelotti and under this new glamorous regime. Um, but in, in fact, he's you know, maybe he's going to be his dropper for the rest of the season. <laughs> well, let's, uh, uh, let's talk some, some Montpellier because, uh, of course, they're top of the league. Finally, we, we get there. Why did we get to them last week? But, of course, Rafi had to ask a silly, long-winded question, and we were <laughs> denied our time with you. So please tell us about Giroud and Girard and all the wonderful things that uh, uh, behind Montpellier's rise to the top. Yeah. Well, of, of course, uh, René Girard, the coach, um, he's, he's got great experience, uh, not just as an international player. Um, he, he was a really important part of a great Bordeaux team. Um, he, he was part of a, a, a good French team as, as well in the 80s. Um, he made contributions to that, but he, he gave absolutely no quarter. And his, his team play like that as well. I, I think everyone looks at Montpellier and think, you know, they've, they've, they've got a, a small stadium, not loads of fans. Aren't they nice little underdogs? There's nothing nice about them. You know, they're really competitive. And that's why um, they're still up there. And they, they gave a good image uh, the, the, of themselves, the, the way they played at, at Paris. But, you know, they've got a bit of grit to add to that as well. But I think you look at some of um, you know, the backbiting that's been between them and PSG, them and Lyon, they're getting under the big boy's skin. I think it really means something. And I, I know Michel Bastos after the, the Montpellier win over Lyon in January, um, which wasn't that much of a shock, and I think that shows how much 
uh, Montpellier have come on. Um, Bastos said he had absolutely no respect uh, for, for Girard um, as, as a person, uh, which I, I thought was fantastic. You know, it shows how much Montpellier have wound the rest of the league up. And, they, they, you know, they've got quality all the way through. Younger and Biwa, who's one of the best centre-backs um, in the league. Uh, Giroud, of course, who's scoring all the goals. Uh, Eunice Belanda, terrific playmaker, um, who, who's got a lot more of a fine touch than his side. His size would uh, suggest, and funnily enough, he could be uh, the North African superstar that PSG are looking for next season. Well, that, that brings me to to my question, really. Do you think that uh, for them, there's almost could be a curse of success the way we've seen it with smaller teams in the past, where they That's do it. really well, they perhaps win even the title, but then completely get uh, raided by by everyone within and without the league, and then, you know, the, uh, the dream finishes even before it's, it's properly started. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right, Raph. But I, I think um, Louis Nicolas, who's um, the, um, uh, the, the, the club's rather pugnacious uh, president, you might say, uh, he'll not be worried about that. He'll be looking at the money, and he'll be looking at the Champions League money. For them, the, the title would be amazing. But it's all about top two. Th their best players will go elsewhere. Younger Mbiwa will has got just a year left on his contract after this season. He'll surely be snapped up by a Premier League side. Uh, Belanda, we've already talked about. Olivier Giroud has um, drawn interest from all over Europe. Um, Bayern Munich and uh, Napoli uh, sent scouts to look at him when they played at PSG last week. Um, so these players will definitely go. And um, when they go, uh, they'll have trouble replacing them with uh, players of the same sort of value. And, um, you know, th th they'll end up just, you know, crying and banking the money and probably finishing 14th next season. Um, but, but that's fine. You, you know, th th they know that's how it is. And if, if you look further up, you know, Lille lost three really important players in the summer. And Lille are a much... A more high spec, ambitious club than uh, Montpellier. They've got this terrific infrastructure. They're really well run. Um, you know, they're building. They're moving into this uh, new uh, 50,000 stadium in the summer, well ahead of uh, Euro 2016. So, I mean, even that stage, Lille is a really, really long way off for Montpellier. But if they play it right, if they look after that money, maybe this is their first building step towards that sort of model, which Lille have to be for them. So, Andy, in a word, who do you think would come third? I, I still think Marseille have got something left in the tank. I mean, if, if you saw the Marseille against Inter game during the week that, that I was at, in fact... Um, you, That's not one word! Of, <laughs> you'll be, yeah, you'll be, you'll be, if, if you were awake until the end, uh, you, you'll be aware of what most people who watch Marseille on a semi-regular basis are, are aware. They're very, very dull to watch. And yeah. uh, Champ has completely defied everyone, who, like the fans, and the sporting director, Jose Anigo, who he doesn't get on with at all, to play a more expansive game. So His a pig-headed response to that the, uh, last summer was to buy three more defensive players. So, so Andy, so, who, who, you have to give us one word. No, he voted for Marseille. So that's it, Marseille. We're going to go with Marseille. Uh, but uh, thank you so much for your time, Andy. I'm sure we'll be speaking to you next week. Pleasure. Okay. See you soon. Oh, yes, I hope to see you soon, too. Stay ahead of the game with Sports Tonight Live. Don't miss a thing. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Search for Sports Tonight Live on Facebook and like our fan page. Follow Sports Tonight TV on Twitter and tweet us your thoughts and opinions. Sports Tonight Live, it's the platform for the fans.